what, what, what department am I in? Department of History and uh, Middle Eastern Islamic Studies at New York University. And uh, I direct the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora at that institution. And this evening, we are delighted to have uh, three leading scholars uh, who write on various aspects of the African diaspora. And we're gonna have a conversation with them uh, about Africans and slavery and post-emancipation. And we're gonna talk about the evolution of the study of these uh, uh, critical moments in, in global history. I want to introduce them in, in alphabetical order, beginning with uh, Professor Aisha Finch of Emory University. Uh, followed by Roshana Johnson, Professor Roshana Johnson, University of Chicago, and Professor Laurie Lambert of Fordham University. Thank you, welcome. I'm so I'm delighted that 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 you could join us, and and uh, I want to welcome you to welcome you to the forum. And I want to welcome those who are in the in the audience, and uh, we're going to have a conversation. Let's see. I think we. I uh, have about 75 minutes, so we'll have a 40, 45 minute conversation somewhere along those lines, and then we will have, we'll open it up to uh, your involvement and your, your questions, interventions, comments, and so forth. So I'm delighted that we're all gathered here uh, in this virtual space. Let me begin with a kind of something that Something that I'm kind of muddling over, if you will, or thinking about, and that is that we all know that <clears throat> uh, certain intellectual trends uh, tend to come out of or be informed by the, 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 the moment in which they're, they're formed, the, the geopolitical uh, configuration, uh, you know, what's... Uh, what's uh, trending at the moment, very large movements. Yeah, and so the, the literature can reflect that. And I was just thinking about how, and my comments will be very brief, but I was just thinking about how, uh, you know, there was that moment, you know, in the, from the 1940s through maybe the 1970s where, um, there was a very critical turn in the study of black people globally and it was um it, it comported right with anti-colonial and anti-imperial movements yeah and so you saw that begin to be reflected in the scholarship and uh you know we continue to talk about slavery and resistance i'm wondering are we <laughs> Is there another way to, to envision this, this conjoined period? Is there another vocabulary? Is there another way of imagining this whereby we, can not, we not only reflect the moment in which we find ourselves, but we facilitate yeah, the movement of our communities beyond where we are? And so I'm, you know, I'm wondering about that. What, what, do you have any thoughts about that, anyone? For example, you know we're in a moment in time right now where we're watching unfold on the other, in the other, you know, on the other side of the world this, you know, this struggle uh, between Russia and Ukraine and and so forth. And Ukraine's response is characterized as resistance. Yeah. And automatically, you know, it, it connotes um, something about power and power disequilibria and how that kind of plays out. And we've been talking a lot about, we talk a lot about slavery, but we talk a lot about resistance. Is that the kind of vocabulary that is that where we find ourselves? Is that is that facilitating any any movement forward? 
It's a question. Is there another way to think about these things? I wonder if the work being done on reparations and thinking about Caribbean studies now is something that um, points to potentially what you're talking about, where we have this, you know, it's real, it's a legal claim that's being made through CARICOM, but the folks who are driving it are really scholars who've been working in slavery and resistance for a long time now. And I think that you know, we're at a moment where the scholarly work that they've done is being moved into a different realm with these claims. You know, we could have different conversations about how much the Caribbean public is engaged in that, but, you know, they are certainly um, demanding to be heard in a particular way. And it, it's meant moving their work out of the academy in particular ways as well, or at least you know, bringing the current political situation into the academy, bringing those things into closer conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think that that, you know, that's definitely an example for me of um, scholarly work that is trying to move us ahead in, in actually very material ways, you know, if these claims are successful. Well, you know, it's of a piece with, with the question about freedom and, and, and what, what freedom means. I mean, you know, you have a kind of classic John Hope Franklin from slavery to freedom trajectory. And, you know, I kind of wonder if, 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 if to some extent we're all kind of still wrestling with that, you know, kind of conventional notion of, of, of you know, the collective experiences of African descended people in the Americas and elsewhere. And so, and so we're moving from, from this, this, this point of, of oppression and capture and, and, and imposition to some other place, to some other thing, some other experience, a set of experiences that we, you know, um, label freedom, uh, and and you know, is it is it time to kind of adjust our vocabulary or 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 begin to think about? I mean, do we know? Do we have a real good sense of how communities in different spaces and over different in different periods thought about the alternative to what they were experiencing I mean we're calling those things we, we call that you know freedom but I mean do we is there another way to capture what people may have been thinking about you know it's interesting I mean for me when I'm thinking about this question <sighs> I, I feel like um, there's almost a time bending quality that I feel like we're witnessing um, with the um, just kind of being in the, the period of the, the movement for Black Lives, right? And, um, and one of the things that you hear in popular discourse so frequently is the idea that we are sort of finding ourselves back in times that we thought had, you know, were long eradicated or that, you know, kind of feeling like we're living back in the Jim Crow South, right? And so, um, so I actually think that in some ways, this kind of persistent <laughs> question of around freedom remains um, kind of an, an urgent mandate in ways that are, um, that are new and capacious, but that also remain terrifyingly um old if that's the word to use right thinking about you know I, I, this is literally i feel like we're witnessing you know what christina sharp is talking about living in the wake um and in terms of the specific vocabularies um i mean i was sort of thinking about um some of the work that's come out in recent years and i think um one of the things that this kind of asks us to 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 think through is um, sort of what are the most, um, what are kind of like the, the, the most useful and the, and the, and the most supple, right, the richest um, kind of language to really adequately capture, you know, what it is that Black folks are struggling with, what, what they're striving for and have done so historically. And I think about Neil Roberts' work, um, right, on freedom as marinage. And I think that for me, is one text that opens up um, 
these really interesting and, and capacious ways to think about this question, in part because he's talking about, um, he, he understands um, the, the phrase freedom of marinage kind of um, signals the idea of this perpetual form of, of, of flight, right? And kind of like this liminal space where, where new black political imaginaries are, are possible. Um, and I think about that alongside, you know, what Jessica talk, Johnson talks about the idea of black femme freedom and kind of this way in which black folks have always had to um, imagine outside of the legal and juridical and political structures of, of the West, right? And um, whether it was metropolitan emancipation, whether it was, um, you know, manumission, right? And, um, and, and I, I, I don't know if freedom is the right vocabulary that feels always so kind of freighted to me because it, it, it kind of stands in for things, right? Especially in this moment. Um, and maybe the, the, the language comes out of thinking about black life, right? And, and some of the folks who are kind of rethinking, you know, social death theory. Um, so those were, those were kind of some thoughts I had around this. Okay. Shauna wanted to jump in here. <laughs> no, I'm listening. Um, you know, maybe this is a compliment to what you're saying. I mean, I'm in the middle of reading Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's um, new memoir um, for class. And it's interesting because it's in some ways, a, I mean, the, the sort of easiest way to characterize it, right? It's sort of thinking about how, you know, how do you grow up a, a white woman in New Orleans and turn into sort of this luminary of the African diasporic history in Louisiana, right? And obviously it goes through this fascinating radical history of being, you know, affiliated with communists and activists of all sorts of varieties in New Orleans, right? And across the South, across the country, globally. Um, and I think one of the things, and, and so, you know, in, in many ways, for, I think for us as historians, right, the database, the book, those are sort of the key moments. But I think what's really powerful about this tale is that, and, and we could substitute any number of other scholars, right? This is just the one I'm reading right now. Um, but, you know, there's something really interesting about the way that, I mean, I guess the, there's one way to think about this in terms of how can the scholarship push, you know, other fronts, but there's something really powerful about the way that struggle and movements and organizers have pushed scholarship. And I think that that's also been something quite interesting to watch in terms of the ways that the needs that are coming up. I, I, it's been an interesting moment to watch communities make demands of scholars. <laughs> and I think it's right. actually transforming, Absolutely. you know, it transforms the kinds of questions we ask and I think the kinds of conversations we have, you know, and I think it ties to some of these questions that we struggle with and we'll probably talk about at some point today, but sort of thinking about archives, methods, violence, and so on. Um, you know, it, it, it just, it, it looks, there's a, it, it looks a different way, right? When you start not from a kind of academic standpoint, but from the perspective of people who are making demands on us as scholars to answer particular questions and to make ourselves useful in these very specific ways. And, you know, that strikes me as incredibly powerful and generative. Well, Professor Johnson, you, you, you refer to the archive. So you've had a lot of work done about about slavery in the archives and the violence of the archive. So where are we now in, the, in our in our in our journey? Where how do we proceed with with our if with our work as historians or literary scholars and so forth? Uh, you know, what are the questions before us? So I don't know if you wanted to if you're eager to jump in on this, Roshana. Um, I mean, this is something that I've, that I've thought about a lot, mm -hmm. um, quite a bit, and, and how to really um, to assess this, this very question of, of kind of where we are. And so for me, there's this, there's this broad literature on archival critique that, that comes from many different disciplines and fields and, and takes many different forms. And, and there's a couple of key things that, that come out of that literature that I find particularly useful and important, particularly for thinking about the work that we do as scholars of the diaspora, right? One is um, thinking about a different kind of relationship with, with, with knowability, right? Just sort of an acknowledgement of what can be known, right? And what can be recovered um, from archives, written archives in particular, particularly um, 
archives that are, you know, that are forged in, in violence, like so many of our archives are, right? And, um, you know, what what can we know? What can we actually, um, you know, think and write about? And, and also, um, you know, I think there's some really interesting, there's kind of a, there's sort of a really substantive body of literature that's asked us to think more critically about um, the desire and even the, the, the training that we get, right? The professional training to kind of constantly, uh, the search or the endeavor to recover, right? And to recuperate, right? And to kind of think about um, the, just even the affective state, right? The feelings that we take with us into the archives about, you know, wanting to be able to find certain things and then what happens when we don't find them and then trying to shift to think about um, maybe those feelings of frustration and disappointment can actually be productive and can produce new ways to read and think and so forth, right? Um, so there's kind of a lot of work that's, um, that's come out around those questions that I think is really, is, is actually really, really important. Um, but for me, the way that I think about the, the, the where we are question um, is really about how to develop um, a different kind of reading practice or a set of reading practices um, that um, you know, recognizes how that violence that people have written about so much in the archive, right, is always kind of pressing into and shaping the stories that we're telling. Um, and yet how um, a different set of reading practices can themselves be a radical endeavor that kind of refuses the, the stranglehold of that violence on Black life. And, um, and kind of, you know, the urgent task for me is to think about you know, kind of the creative and, and nimble ways to write through that violence, to tell other kinds of, you know, other kinds of stories. Um, and I think that, I mean, to, so, you know, our work is, is, is fundamentally always about like piecing together the shards, right, and working through the fragments and sifting through the rubble effectively um, and kind of doing that carefully and attentively um, allows for these more kind of complex and intriguing understandings of, of, of Black life to, to emerge. Um, but I think about like, you know, what Martha Hodes talks about, like this idea of taking leaps of grounded imagination um, as a way to kind of weave together those, those shards, right? Which, which in a lot of ways actually dovetails with, you know, what Hartman talks about of critical fabulation, right? Um, so I, for me, the, the, the where are we now is sort of thinking about, um, and a lot of histories have come out recently to do this, right? Kind of like these, what are the creative and, and, and dexterous ways that we can think about to kind of practice, you know, almost like an archival marinage, right? Kind of like an intellectual practice of, of, of weaving through these fragments, um, but also circumventing and in fact upending you know, the goals of Black captivity and the project of empire that, that structures the archive and to recognize that, you know, those, um, those kinds of stories that always push against and exceed, you know, white coloniality, they are there. And, and how, um, how can we engage with them and how can we think about different ways of accessing them? Does that, but does archival marinage imply a kind of insularity or? Insularity, Wait, say a little bit more. About well, I'm, that. Try, I'm trying to understand your concept of, of archival marinage. Oh, I'm just, you know, kind of that's emerging as I'm as I'm speaking. Okay, oh, okay. Right this, All is right. a, this is not All a fleshed right. out theory. All right, we'll work with I guess, it. We'll what, work. I guess what I'm what I'm what I'm thinking about is that the very people that we're studying to me kind of um, model the kind of tools, the intellectual tools that we can utilize um to to think about how to do this work right and so for and for for so many of them you know there were these grand moments of you know organized resistance and uprising and so forth right but for so many of them it was about plotting a path through the everyday right and literally figuring out how to make a life in the midst of this white violence right and so that just it just suggests to me that um and i don't want to take up two more time um, for my fellow panelists, but on this, but just it, it suggests to me that that could be a methodology, right, for how we think about um, the ways in which we then in, engage with the, the documents that are produced about their life. Okay, okay. Uh, Professor Lambert or Professor Johnson, would you like to comment on that? I have some, some more questions for you. 
think, you know, it's interesting, like um, you talked about the sort of affective terrain of confronting different levels of disappointment or, you know, violence in the archive and in, um, you know, certain kinds of literary work, I think there's an effort to deal with just that specifically, like I'm thinking about Norbesse Phillips Zong, you know, which is not not producing new knowledge about what happened with the Zong massacre, but rather providing a, a kind of meditative space for us to think through, you know, what's the affective to like, what does that even mean for us to be having to contemplate that today? Or, or what are the ways in which that hasn't been given the space that it ought to be given? And, and how can she produce that in this text? And she's, you know, it's interesting there is that then she produces the document at the end of this book of poetry, you know, this long um, serial poem, but it's just contextualized differently. And I think about that as sort of creating these sort of new contexts for these fragments that we're working with, um, opening up a space to think about repair, opening up a space to think about um, what it means for us to have to work through these, these shards or these fragments. I think about um, Dion Brand's A Map to the Door of No Return is doing a similar thing, you know, and it starts with this very question of the inability to recover, right? She's asking her grandfather, what is the ethnic group that we came from? And he, he thinks he can remember, but he just can't. And, you know, as a child, she just wants to keep harping on that question. And then the book proceeds in that way, you know, what does it mean to have to think through contemporary Black life that starts in this, this place of, um, loss but you know at the, I don't think she's saying it's entirely a place of loss because there's a relationship she has with her grandfather that you know even allows her to be able to ask that question you know that, that's you know it seems to raise a, a related issue uh, that perhaps the three of you can can address and that has to do with with disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity and anti-disciplinarity and so forth and I guess the general question is, what is the relationship of the discipline of the uh, of these, uh, you know, of the discipline to what we're trying to accomplish as scholars uh, trying to understand uh, these experiences of African descended people around the world, the Americas, elsewhere? Uh, we come through a certain kind of training, et cetera, and so forth. And then we fight with that training. Uh, what's coming out of that uh, out of that struggle? You know, you've you've some of you know you've kind of um, alluded to it with respect to the archive, and a lot of work has been done on um, on critiquing the archive. Yes. Uh, so where are we with respect to the relationship of of disciplines to the study of Black folk? Do you find that uh, in your, you know, do you find that historians, for example, are becoming more and more open to and aware of, and in fact are investing in other optics, other lenses outside of the, you know, outside of the historical field in order to, 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 to unpack what they're trying to do? I mean, do we, and, 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 you know, is that reflected in other kinds of of quote unquote disciplines. I'd like to jump in because in some ways I think this will link the previous question to this one. You know, sometimes I see, and I feel kind of curmudgeonly about this, but sometimes it's useful to just sort of have old school kind of, you know, to sort of claim like old school archival historical work for certain purposes, right? And because I think it comes to a matter of audience, right? And so sometimes we're having, again, sort of academic conversations but sometimes, especially when we're thinking about public engagement, you know, you know, any number of, you know, thinking about sort of these debates about monuments or some of these debates about sort of accountability and ties to reparations, like sometimes there can be usefulness in some of the authority of the discipline of history and being able to, you know, kind of say like, okay, based on your own terms and your own methods of evidence, here are the kinds of claims I can make that go in this other direction. And sometimes that can be very useful and very important. But obviously, it's not intellectually satisfying in, in yeah. many ways, and so I think mm -hmm. that that, and, but and so I think that the other side of that is 
you know, to my mind, and again, I think maybe this comes to sort of training or, or location or so on, but, you know, I do think that there's a, I worry, I guess, that there is a, a sort of reduced understanding of what historians do or sort of our capacity for thinking in broad ways. You know, I do think that there are many ways to be historians, and I think I've been really moved by the work of senior scholars who have long had a history of drawing on work from across disciplines, beyond disciplines, and invigorating our scholarship with that. So on the one hand, I do think that there is some, it is worth flagging. I think it's important to note that there's some really important contributions going on, but I do think it's also important to remember that many scholars of African descent, many historians of African descent have long been accustomed to breaking methodological boundaries and producing interesting and important scholarship um, that takes into account, that, that rigorously takes into account a lot of these um, questions, which is not to say that we don't need to do more for sure. Um, but, you know, I do think there's precedent for this. And I go through that long explanation to say, you know, that this is history, right? Like among other things, right? It is a, a, a valid and important contribution to the discipline itself. And I would get very nervous if in these conversations, and I'm not saying this happening here anyway, right? But I would get very nervous about this idea that we can somehow not have to grapple with some of these important contributions, critiques, you know, outside of the discipline if we choose to remain firmly nestled within the discipline. These are absolutely critiques that we have to continue to think through within the discipline and beyond, I think, just so that we don't let historians off the hook too easily, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think that's good. I think that's good. Well, what do we do with questions of gender and sexuality? How do those questions change the kinds of of questions we ask with respect to slavery, post-emancipation. How do gender and sexuality change how we think about core questions around captivity and freedom? How do we talk about masculinities and sexuality in slavery studies, post-slavery studies? I just wanted to, to really briefly um, just really echo and support what Roshana was just saying mm -hmm. um, in the sense that um, and in, in um, circling back to the question about gender and, and sexuality, but just to, 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 just to stay for one moment with the question of, of disciplinarity, I feel like the study of slavery, um, historical studies of slavery, um, for me, that's always been um, um, an interdisciplinary project, right? And not necessarily in the sense that we might um, think of interdisciplinarity now, right? Like, did you use a novel to analyze this this text, right? But in terms of, um, or or this 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 sets of ideas, right? But but I feel like the the um, the kind of rich intellectual tradition of African diaspora history that we have inherited, right, has always been about um, a kind of profaning of certain. Um, um, sort of entrenched disciplinary norms, right? And reaching for the, um, the, the language, the methods, right? The, um, the, the, me the uh, theoretical frameworks that will allow people to tell these kind of rich and, and rigorous stories. So I just wanted to, um, to really agree with, with Roshana on that. And, and I, you know, I think that there's, there's so much to say about the question of gender and sexuality in the and the ways in which it's um, kind of pushing the field in these important and critical and exciting ways, particularly with respect to to um, new scholarship that's come out. Um, I mean, I I think that when we take gender seriously, right, as a category of analysis and place that at the center of the way that we start to have these conversations, um, then then we see kind of a lot of our fundamental frameworks um, um, expanding in ways that we that we really hadn't thought about before, right? Ideas about freedom, ideas about citizenship, idea, ideas about resistance. And just to give one uh, very brief example, you know, for example, Vanessa Holden's work. Um, she recently published a book on the 1831 Southampton Rebellion, right? The Nat Turner Rebellion, right? And centering the, the voices and experiences of, of women and children. Um, and she's thinking about something that, um, that I'm also wanting to think about, um, which is kind of, among other things, kind of these gender geographies um, of, 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 of what constitutes resistance. And she and has this place where, you know, in talking about the kitchen, right? The kitchen as sort of like, you know, how does that really 
shift the ways in which we think about organized slave resistance and organized um, like slave politics really um, when we take the kitchen right or in some of the thinking that I'm trying to do thinking around like the garden plot right the conuco as it was called in Cuba um, as a um, as as kind of central to to the ways in which um, these kinds of political conversations were happening, right? People were making connections, people were understanding um, kind of new possibilities and, and, and dreams and visions um, through these through these gendered sites. So, I mean, there's, there's this, you know, something that's near and dear to my heart. So there's a lot that I could say, but I mean, that, that's kind of what I would offer in terms of just an initial response is that it kind of um, asks us not to just sort of add women to the story, right? Or in the very, 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 new and nascent field that people are starting to to, to um, pioneer, right? Adding queer folks to the story, right? A sort of add and, and, and stir model, but really thinking about how does that actually fundamentally shift the, the very categories that we're working with, right? And the very ways in which we're kind of entering into these stories. So your response to the question then is that it's shifting the, cate the categories of analysis. Correct. Okay. Among other things, yes. Among other, among and, and asking, and also asking us to ask different kinds of questions as well, different and, and, and better questions. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Uh, professors Lambert or Johnson, would you like to respond to the, to to that? Well, I think about. I mean, so I I think about your book. You know, when I think about that question, you know, where you're sort of asking about how do we think about leadership of um revolt or you know you know pl you know planning conspiracies and things like that when we add gender um to the equation you do have to ask different questions about you know how are these movements of resistance how are they organized as you were pointing out where are they organized as you talked about the kitchen i thought about marlon james's the book of night women mm -hmm. and the sort of sites in which women organize um you know in that novel um and so I think one of the things with um, gender and sexuality is that, and the reason why, at least in Caribbean studies, a lot of the um, new work is making interventions in that area. I think it's related as well to question, these different questions about method, different questions about archive, where to look for things, what's a source, that kind of thing. And so I think that when folks are, um, interested in looking at gender, interested in looking at sexuality, it necessarily demands um, certain kinds of um, methodological creativity or expansion or, you know, just pushing the boundaries of what might um, be the sort of conventional mode of doing things. Are there important theoretical interventions that, that have emerged over the last 10, 20 years uh, that have redirected us or, or um, um, seriously impacted the way we understand slavery and post-slavery studies? So, you know, we're past Foucault and all of those folks. Is there anything more recent that we need to be, you know, thinking about? Trio's yeah. book, I think is like, that's one of the things I notice is just in the footnotes of every, um, yeah, um, silencing the past, I would say has been one of, and, and so again. But, but they're, you know what though, but they're only reading the first part of the book. This is true. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about what he was wants to talk about the second part of a book. That's right. You gotta sign the whole book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Um how do we have conversations about resistance? Is this word across disciplines? Uh, how do we rethink and reimagine the importance of concepts such as agency? resistance and conversation with interdisciplinary frameworks like refusal, fugitivity, sabotage, that type of thing. 
All right, nobody wants to handle uh, that question. Yeah, I could, did you wanna, Rashawn, I didn't know if you were just on the verge of, yeah, so, I mean, I think this is a really interesting question because I think there's um, a way at which, um, I liked Rashana's rant earlier. Um, and so I think there's there's a reductive way in which it can become kind of an either or type of, of conversation, right? Um, we're either talking about, you know, resistance, you know, an agency, and, and these kinds of um, more traditional or familiar categories, or we're talking about something that's kind of more um, interesting, right, and sophisticated and, and seductive, like some of these other concepts, um, you know, fugitivity, et cetera, right? Um, and, and to me, um, a much more generative way to think about it is sort of where those concepts um, speak to one another, right? And, and I think that the, um, the conversation around, um, around marinage um, really lends itself to, to, um, to really kind of thinking about the, the ways in which a theoretical concept like fugitivity um, has like all of this really exciting um, implications for how we talk about um, something like marinage in very in very practical terms within slavery studies. Um, and one of the things that I think is particularly interesting is the idea, um, and I, I talked about Neil Roberts' work um, already, um, but the, the idea of, um, of fugitivity, right, as something that's not just about the literal act of escape, right, or the literal act of, of flight, um, but that involves, in ways, I might add, going back to Rashana's point that slavery scholars have been talking about for years, right, but that involves um, kind of a fundamental disavowal of the overarching or governing logics, right, of, of white supremacy, of, of capitalism, of oppressive state power. Um, so that concept of of refusal that may or may not actually involve something that looks like resistance, so to speak, right? Like where you may or may not even actually be quote like leaving, you know, the plantation. And I think folks like, you know, um, you know, Moten and Harney, folks like Tina Camp, right, have thought about this in um, in some really beautiful ways. Like, you know, Sarah Haley writes, you know, in these gorgeous ways about sabotage, which goes to, you know, things that, you know, Robin Kelly was arguing about freedom dreams, right? There's actually kind of this, this important way in which all these ideas are speaking together about what Black people, um, not only about what they refuse, but also about what they create, like what, what they produce, you know, Black people involved in a project of, you know, the work of imagination, the work of creativity, the work of love, the work of other kinds of, you know, desires for other kinds of worlds. And so I think that those, um, those sorts of conversations um, can really kind of add a lot of dimensionality um, when we don't necessarily feel like we have to sort of jettison right or get rid of resistance as 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 a concept that's just sort of a a deflated and sterile category and actually think about the fact in which the fact that the ways in which historians have been writing about this and certainly the ways in which enslaved and free people enacted it was always this kind of dynamic um you know fluid um category that that um that kind of asks us to think and think in all these kinds of interesting and different ways um, about black life and 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 social life within social death and, and all these kinds of questions. So hmm. yeah, I'd like to second that. And in some ways, it seems I keep circ I keep answering questions sort of <laughs> in this very kind of late way, but, but I think it takes time for me to sort of synthesize. But it makes me think a little bit about the previous question in terms of books that have or or, people, or you know works of scholarship that have had significant influence and I kind of went to Stephanie Camp's right um you know closer to freedom and to, and for the reason that you know I mean this book passes muster with historians right it's it's you know, it holds its own <laughs> among historians but you know Camp was working through interdisciplinary means drawing on scholars and thinkers from a number of disciplines and really pushing this category of resistance in particular 
onto terrain that I certainly, you know, that I certainly found generative. And I remembered reading it for the first time and I had no idea the kind of impact it would have on my own scholarship or the broader sort of a generation of scholars at this point. Um, but it strikes me as one kind of example of a, of a work that kind of speaks to this conversation that we're having in terms of thinking about the ways that history is a discipline in conversation with lots of other important disciplines can work not only to invigorate some of the concerns that historians have been turning around, but I think can in turn through sort of conceptualizing something like the pleasures of resistance, sort of thinking about um, you know, new ways of thinking through you know, the, the, the places we would look to produce, not, uh, to back to Aisha's point, like to produce knowledge about this category, you know, through especially centering gender, sexuality, women, and um, allows us to get to information that we would not otherwise, allows us to invigorate the categories in ways we would not otherwise and I think ultimately invigorate a number of different paths of inquiry in ways we might not have anticipated before. Let me ask you this question. If you were to construct a study of the long durée uh, from slavery to post-slavery, let's say from you know, the 16th century into the late 19th century, what are the thematics that you would like to see in such a study? What, 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 what that, that are not, and let me rephrase the question, that, are not norm, that do not normally show up in such studies? So, you know, how, how would our, how would that go beyond, you know, we, we, you know, you have to talk about the whip and you have to talk about, you know, from sun up to sundown, wakada, wakada. But are there other kinds of thematics, other kinds of issues? We've talked about gender, sexuality, and so forth and so on. But there is, are there other ideas, other themes that um, we, need to, we need to put more focus on? And also, I would like to ask you, if you had multiple authors writing about this period, do you want what constitutes coherence in that in that in that in that conversation do you want varying perspectives do you want debate do you do, you know what how do you what constitutes coherence can can so, can your study tolerate or even encourage disagreement with scholars. We don't agree with each other. So how do you represent that disagreement? Or would you want to represent that disagreement? It really depends on what the disagreement is about. I feel like okay. there are some very contentious disagreements in the, you know, the study of the history of slavery that, you know, in the past, some of them boiled down to racism. Uh, so, you know, like, obviously, that's not something that would pass muster today. But, um, so I think it depends on... But, you know, within, you know, within, with uh, among scholars who are not necessarily racist or sexist or homophobic, but you know, they have, they, they disagree on, you know, you know, what are the generous generative sources for, for change mm -hmm. uh, in society and so forth. They have differences of opinion. And uh, is that, would you like to see those differences of opinion reflected? And how would you do that? That can work because sometimes those scholars are at what is part of what's motivating them is the conversation between themselves. Oh. I'm thinking about the like um, Afro pessimism, Black optimism set of scholars that, you know, that that conversation doesn't happen unless they're disagreeing. Um, okay. So let me, so we're going to wrap up this, this, this segment because we want to get, we want to get to the Q&A, but you know, as we transition to the Q&A, I would be really interested to hear if there are ideas that have developed over the last several years that we need to, uh, for which we need to give more emphasis, we need to um, 
devote more time, develop a little bit more. Uh, it's, I think it, was, it's, it, it would be part of a question, if you had an opportunity to put together a study uh, of the period from, from slavery to post-emancipation, what would be new in your study? Yeah. So we could think about that and perhaps come to it, you know, uh, in the Q and A as you as you as you um, ponder that. Okay, we're going to go to the to the to the Q and A now. And uh, Mr. Chu, you've had your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Mr. Chu. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, do I see any hands, any other hands? Miss, oh, Dr. Hewlett, please. Professor, Dr. Hewlett? What's happening? What are we doing? Can we hear folks who are asking questions? She needs to oh, be chat. You, she needs to she be needs unmuted. To be unmuted. Uh, can I do that? Let's see. Okay, let's see if I can One do that. Second. Okay, there you are. No, that's me. I. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you a bit. Hear you. Awesome. Well, one, I'm just so excited to see all of these lovely individuals here. Um, I want Dr. Hewlett. Dr. Hewlett. Yes. Hello. Dr. Hewlett. Why can't, why can't we see your face? Uh, I, listen, you couldn't hear me a second ago. This is progress. My, my question, um, as a person who um, is now at the helm of an organization that wants to tackle in a couple of years, um, creating a resource on slavery for uh, grades for students in middle and, and high school. I'm curious as to where you might start with a, a group of kids that range from ages six to 12 um, in terms of what are some core issues? What are some of the building blocks? What do students where do they start? How do they enter understanding this history? And I mean, I'm talking not just about um, students of African descent, although that's my primary concern, but students more broadly in this country. You know what's interesting? Um, in my former life, I taught middle school. And I remember having a conversation um, with one of my colleagues about this. And she said, without having ever spoken to my Gomez, that you have to start in Africa. Mm -hmm. And she was very insistent about the idea that um, it was sort of really important to ground students in the fact, in the, in the concept, right? That, um, that, um, that black histories do not sort of begin with captivity and enslavement. Right, so that's one thing that I would say, um, and um, and I think that actually gives them kind of like a different sort of um, a different sort of perspective, right, and a different sort of way to to then come to the study of slavery. Um, I mean, that's one thing that I would say. Another thing that I would say is that I do think. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, on the one hand, I have critiques of the traditional ways in which, you know, slavery is taught through sort of like the Harriet Tubman's and the, and the you know, Frederick Douglass's and so forth, right? Um, and I think that there's a way in which that always kind of exceptionalizes, right, particular figures. That being said, I also think that there's something really, um, really important and really worthwhile about students, particularly at that age, being able to actually have concrete figures that they can, um, that they can kind of study and latch onto and that then become vehicles through which 
they can understand and, and kind of think, of, and it doesn't have to be, right? Like only the, you know, the Harriets and, and, and the Fredericks, so to speak, but, but sort of like, um, and it's better even if they're not exceptional figures necessarily, right? But, um, but sort of people who can anchor um, the ways in which they're thinking about, um, thinking about black life. That's something that I just sort of keep coming back to these days, right? Just understanding that in the midst of all these brutality, people lived and they created family, right? And they, um, and they kind of produced sociality and, and produced life. Um, so that's kind of another thing that I would say. And the final thing that I would say, and then I would just would love to hear what my other co-panelists um, think about this is I think it's really important um, that they are exposed to the kinds of things that I was never exposed to until I got to college, right? Which is thinking about resistance, right? Learning about the Nat Turner Rebellion. Um, and I never really thought about the ways in which um, just even like centering that kind of story. And again, it doesn't have to be necessarily always about grand narratives of resistance, right? Thinking of teaching about marinage, I think, right? Is um, grand marinage as well as petite marinage, right? The Stephanie Camp argument. Um, um, and again, particularly, did you say grade six or children age six as in like starting younger, like first graders, Tanya, Professor Hewlett? She, uh, okay. let's see, I, I, I think I have to unmute her again. Oh, I'm okay. here. Okay. okay, all right. Okay. okay, you have to unmute her one more time. Starting at grade six. Starting at grade six, okay, all right. Um, so, but yeah, just um, building that narrative into mm -hmm. the, the ways in which they're also taught about this kind of brutally oppressive and totalizing system, um, I think gives, gives students um, particularly Black students, right, a different kind of relationship to to that material and 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 to that history, so that it always doesn't doesn't always just feel like um, sort of that the affective weight of like the, the drudgery and the, mm -hmm. the shaking, the anger, all of these things, right? So just different kind of ways into the story, I would say. But you know, this is an interesting conversation. I like to pursue it just a little bit because. Uh, Dr. Hewlett is working on the other on the other end of this. She's just as qualified as anybody in this forum. And I'm I'm wondering what is your, for example, you know, the country is has been uh, taken over with this uh, anti-CRT business. What's been your experience in in your place and at the level of your profession? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> thank you for asking that, and uh, thank you for the compliment. I think you know I am. To answer that straightforwardly, right? Uh, an all-out assault. There's been an all-out assault on the ability to tell the truth about this country as we know, right? And there's been a resistance on coming from a number of different areas, to be honest with you, um, to students having um, the maturity um, and, the, and the critical thinking skills to grapple with this history. There's a fear that if we tell the truth, they won't love this country. And I think the naivete that's rooted in that is the presumption that students love this country in the first place and that people can't hold complex ideas. So I think that this is an uphill battle, certainly thinking about particularly how we tell the truth of slavery, the story of slavery, because a lot of people believe they know that story. They know it through Harriet Tubman. They know it through, through Frederick Douglass. And the less said about it, the better. But they don't understand, I think, a lot of what... Um, Dr. Finch talked about in terms of the one, the liberatory potential for some, or maybe they do understand that and that's why they resist it so much, I'm unsure. The liberatory potential for some um, and the way that a great deal of the structures and realities that we see in our present day life are rooted in those dynamics. And once again, I'm not sure if they don't understand that or if that's precisely what they're pushing back against. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hewlett. It's good to hear from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hewlett. It was very good to hear from you. I want to turn to uh, Professor Miki. You have a question in the chat, but uh, you're free to ask. I'm going to allow you to talk. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Uh, thank you to everyone for this wonderful conversation. And I'm 
preparing dinner with a seven-year-old. So I apologize if there's any background, but she's been listening in. Um, so my question was, you know, we're all, oh, uh, we're historians. And, and of course, Dr. Lambert is also trained in literature, but I'm just interested in this moment, right? We had this Afro-pessimist moment and now we're, everything is Afro-futurism. Um, and there's been lots of conversations. I've also participated in these events as a historian, which has been a really interesting experience. But sometimes I've noticed that the conversations a lot about let's not talk about slavery anymore because it's depressing. It's too painful that we can imagine different futures, right? Um, so in a way it's Afrofuturism has also become this turning away sometimes from the history of slavery. And I'm wondering how as historians of slavery of the black past, how can we inform hopeful futures while also accounting for the legacies of slavery in the, pre in the present or in the wake as some of us um, are understanding it. Just one so I want my so I want my colleagues to respond to you, but you know the study of just as the study of slavery can be a kind of escapism. I hear in your in your question a concern uh, uh, about the degree to which Afrofuturism is also a kind of a form of of escapism. Am I am I misinterpreting? Do I hear that? Do I have? Is there a valence of that in your in your question? Uh, I don't know if it's an escapism, but I guess it's a way of imagining a different possibilities and future. So in a way, I, for me, I personally saw it overlaps with the black radical tradition, right? Which of course has a very long trajectory. Um, but I also, maybe this is also where I stand out with my own work. In my first work, I wrote so much about marinage, about resistance, about envisioning different futures. And for one thing or another, I'm currently writing about the slave trade. And it is so hard to write about. And I'm kind of struggling to write about hope, about humanity, about and it's that's a history that's not just about loss right and about death um and the kind of ethical dimensions of it and i'm it's just you know i'm just wondering that we always need these and in so much of the study of of slavery and resistance is about envisioning different futures and i think in a way afrofuturism is part of that intellectual tradition but i'm also just wondering right now like you know how do we reckon with this past history without being escapist right it doesn't i don't think it has to be that way but but i'm wondering and but you're but you but you're but you're 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 flat you're you're flagging a problem, and that is to say that there's some kind of disconnect between Afrofuturism and and the historical and certain historical realities. Or disconnect, or I'm wondering how we can establish those connections, I guess. Not necessarily yeah. disconnect. I'm wondering, and I'm I guess I'm just asking you, how would you envision? Yeah. Do you okay. envision connections? That's such a weird um the, the idea of doing Afrofuturism or thinking about like black speculative futures and not thinking about slavery sounds so strange to me because when I think about black speculative literature and like somebody like Octavia Butler, who's so historically grounded, I mean, our actual histories are the scaffolding for the speculative worlds that she imagines. And, um, and a lot of them are, if you want to escape, like they're not, uplifting you know i mean parable of the sower or parable of the talents there are there are these you know kernels of hope you know and you know acorn and this idea of like growth in futures but they're also um dystopic in ways that i think are actually quite useful to us mm -hmm. um like last year for um a couple of my classes we read you know those two parable books and sort of talked about how prescient it felt to us to um, be at a moment that felt that she had sort of speculated about, you know, and, and that felt close to what she'd speculated about. So I, I guess I um, kind of would disagree with the idea that the futurism means mm -hmm. like some kind of progressive, like, it's not always the horizon of possibility. I'm not saying the horizon of possibility and hopefulness isn't there. I, I think it is, but that I don't take that as the central concern of um, Black speculative texts. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your question, Professor Miki. Uh, here's a question from, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Wind or Vin Petropa. Um, yes, my name is Wend. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, actually. Um, my first question is, um, 
how do we define blackness in the United States, not just in academia, but also in pop culture? Um, I am an African immigrant and I've always felt there's been a separation or divide between the way people um, viewed dark skin and then and people from African descent, but from different countries as well. So how do we reconcile the separation um, between the diversities of ethnic backgrounds and being from all over the place and having black skin? Okay. Anyone like to answer that, respond to that? Professor Johnson, you wanna take that question? Uh, sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, you are on the call. I mean, you're right there. Um, no. <laughs> you were saying this is a Gomez question. Over there else <laughs> one. I, I'm just moderating. I'm just moderating. I'm trying to ask relevant questions. <laughs> I think that's a very important question. You know, I think it's a very important question, and it goes back to this to this larger question of sort of what do we mean when we talk about the African diaspora and writing histories of the African diaspora. And, and in some ways, I think it goes back to the previous question, um, which is that I think we can't be afraid of complexity. And I think that the most exciting scholarship on African diasporic histories, you know, you know, think through these things in really rigorous, complex, sometimes unflattering, unromantic ways and, and really grapple with a lot of those tensions and also grapple with the ways that you know, I, I think one really trouble, right, the idea of some sort of natural complication free um, sense of affinities to instead really think through. And I think perhaps even render all of the more remarkable the ways that people of African descent have made community and have built networks um, under circumstances that haven't been ideal in many cases. And I think that there's a reason to think about that in the context of slavery and emancipation into the present. And I know there are many other people on the call who can comment on this, um, but I think it's a very important question. And I think kind of animates a lot, it's, it's sort of something that's resting at the core of many of the sorts of questions that we've thought through um, to this point. But I, you know, I'd invite other people to weigh in. Mm -hmm. uh, when Petroy, Petroypa, did you have a second question? Yes, uh, my question, my second question was similar to Daniel's question. Um, is it possible for African Americans or just people of color to be racist? That question makes me nervous. Um, so, and I think that there's, I mean, there's a there's a couple of different ways to think about that, right? Um, so I'm not, so without knowing the broader context of the question itself, um, one of the things that I think we have to think about, especially in our current political moment, right? Um, is the fact that, um, the concept of racism has a very long history, right? And it intentionally signals a structure of white supremacy, <laughs> a, a white supremacist domination, right? And so the idea that black people can sort of, um, can sort of have access to that, um, to that kind of power, right? To then be racist um, really troubles me. And I think we need to think um, very deeply about that, particularly because literally as we speak in the conversations around the 1619 Project, et cetera, right, there's accusations that are floating around of Black people are being racist because they want to create an intellectual discourse that privileges Black scholars and that maybe holds white scholars and white historians accountable, right? Um, and, you know, as um, Dr. Johnson was just saying, um, at the same time, we also have to very much be present with the fact that um, that various forms of, of privilege and and, um, and 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 sort of deep rifts, right, around class, around culture, around all of these things, um, have also long been a part of African diasporic histories, right, and also shape the ways in which um, the interactions of Black people with other people of color, right, other other dispossessed um, and, and vulnerable people. 
and other colonized people in particular. So I think that there is a really important and generative conversation to have about that, right? Um, and, and in a particular context, but the just sort of the question as it was the basic question that was framed, um, I would I would really take issue with the 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 core logic right of of, of what does it mean for Black people to write? There would there would have to be a lot that would have to be sort of fundamentally reversed right for for Black people to be able to sort of enact right um, racism in the way that 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 we think about it if we under if in fact we understand racism as indelibly tied to a centuries long project of white supremacy and colonialism. If I could jump in, I, I, I would just like to add to that. Um, it, in some ways it goes back to some of the earlier questions in terms of thinking about how to teach the history of slavery. I think one critical part within that larger conversation is sort of why was it useful, right? Like really making, like really having us sort of think through not only sort of what did people of African descent experience, but also what sorts of macro level processes, transformations did it allow? And that I think raises a, a difficult conversation as we, you know, as we can see in our current moment, but I think it's an essential one because it takes us out, you know, it takes us out of sort of the realm of feelings and, and, and sort of, you know, ideas and really helps us to really think about structures, processes, um, and sort of thinking through the ways that those have worked and continue to work and continue to be reproduced in certain ways um, that, that I think are absolutely essential context for thinking through some of these questions. Yeah. You know, going back to what we were discussing earlier about ways in which this kind of scholarship could move uh, the conversation forward and, and hopefully our respective communities uh, along with it. You know, one of the things that this type of uh, project could do would be to bring um, uh, into conversation uh, developments in the Americas with developments elsewhere. And I, for, for, for example, I think that there's a lot more that we can uncover and discuss uh, during this period uh, from the 16th through the 19th century there's a lot more that we can do uh, to, to kind of uncover and investigate the ways in which the experience in the Americas refracts upon what happens in Africa. And we don't, we, we're not doing enough with that. Yeah, but those are very, very important. Uh, you know, that those are very, very important moments in the in the history or histories of various parts of the African continent. And I think we also, it, it, it kind of uh, messes a bit with our temporalities because, but, but we need to also have conversations about, you know, you know, enslaved populations, captive populations, enslaved Africans in other parts of the world. And I think this does really, you know, it helps us to understand uh, those experiences as well as uh, the experiences in the Americas, and I'm, you know, here thinking specifically about North America, other parts of the Muslim world, um, and elsewhere. I think that's so. I would like to have, I would like to see more scholarship develop uh, with respect to these questions. These are they're deep. We talk about the silence and the and the violence of the archive as it pertains to the Americas, and 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 the the <laughs> the violence and the silences are in are are uh, deafening, you know, in these parts of the world with respect to how, uh, with respect to how people um, have been treated and how they continue to be treated. So that's something I would like to do. The other thing I'd like to propose to you is to think about going back to this question of terminology and vocabulary. Obviously, we've had a, there's been a long discussion about, you know, how we characterize experiences and how we characterize people and you know, we've long moved away from just simply calling people slaves, uh, and and we've you know got we, so I think I think the, the scholarship has gone a long way toward understanding the humanity of people and the Afri and that these in the Africanity of these people and and uh, you know even you know we, we're very careful with uh, using terms like enslaved as opposed to slave and so forth and so on. So we've had those conversations. Mm. I, I'm I'm wondering about. I want to go back to this business about resistance. 
And I'm wondering to what extent does it encapsulate those experiences? In what way is it limiting with respect to those experiences? And how can we get out of that? Or do we want to get out of that? It's just a question. You know, um, in the in the in the US, you know, we have uh, uh, a growing number of monuments and museums and so forth and so on dedicated to the black experience. And I'm all for that. I'm all for it. I'm not opposed to it. Invariably, they're about slavery and civil rights movement. And I just wonder is there a way to bring about public conversations about the Black experience that bring us beyond these sorts of seminal moments? So that on the one hand, these, these kinds of institutions are critical and they are important and I support them. But on the other hand, I wonder to what extent do they propel us toward a better future? It's a question. What do you think about that? So you're thinking of, you're asking about kind of the politics of memorialization? The politics of memorialization, yes. And um, for example, uh, I'll give you an example of what I, what I, sort of what I have in mind. At one point, I was involved with the UNESCO um, Slave Roots Project. And I was of the opinion that we needed to go beyond slave roots, that we needed to have a more comprehensive uh, discussion about the experiences of Black people globally. And I thought, that it, I thought that it was limiting and to some extent uh, counterproductive for UNESCO to be solely interested in slave roots, in the slave roots. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, my proposal was not supported. People are very, very happy to talk about slavery and to focus on the slave roots as, as the Black contribution to the world. Uh, yeah, so I am straining with the ways in which all that we do can somehow not only do justice to, you know, um, the difficulties and, 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 and pain and, and destruction of the past, but also facilitate momentum toward transformation of those experiences, moving us forward. And I'm struggling with that. I'm straining with that. I'm not satisfied. Uh, with, with the state of affairs as they now exist. And it's a question. And I don't have a lot of answers, but I would like to have a more in, involved conversation with, with you people and other colleagues about how we might, how we might do that. Yeah. The difficulty seems to be how, um how our present moment still feels so connected to that past. Um, you know, it's like you're caught in a kind of morass, you know, where, for, you know, if you teach something like, you know, I'm thinking of um, Coates's article on, on reparations and redlining and all of that. And, um, it remains part of our reality. Like when I teach that, I also, you know, there's like articles from 2021, you know, for students around um, housing issues and racism and housing and things like that. And so it's hard not to draw a line. Like it, it's kind of hard to take yourself out of that framework. 
um, and into a reality that's not um, connected in that way, you know, for folks who are in this part of the world. Now, I think if you ask this question of scholars on the continent, that would be, you know, there would be a, a totally different response, I would imagine. But is there a way to, but is there a way to connect it? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to maintain that, 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 uh, to, to be grounded, right? In the in in those experiences, to not deny them or any or take to take anything away from them, yeah. But at the same time, find a way to move the conversation forward. Yeah. Well, it's a question. We've run out of time. I just want to say <laughs> that. The one of the things that I thought of right away, this is not what you were trying to get to at all. Mm. The problem with um, the memorialization process is then you end up with some tomfoolery like the Georgia State Senate approving a statue of Clarence Thomas on in the Georgia State Capitol. Now, you know, I'm not talking about that. I know you're not talking about that. Yeah. But, what, but what I'm saying is there's a way in which, right, that process of having to, it, it necessarily, what you, what you were talking about, right, was um, thinking about kind of the process of memorialization, right, sort of, and it forces a conversation about who and what we hold up, right, yeah. in a way that I think can kind of narrow and flatten out the conversation. And that's an egregious example, obviously, right? But mm -hmm. um, but in ways that don't always necessarily go to what Lori was talking about and trying to get us to think about it, what I think you're trying to get us to think about, right? Which is how do we build a new future, right? Mm -hmm. How do we build a new vision? Yeah, I think that's an important conversation. Uh, okay, but... Thank you so much, colleagues, professors, Laurie Lambert, Roshana Johnson, Aisha Finch. Thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank everybody who was in attendance, your questions, people who were in the chat room and so forth. And I wanna thank uh, Sharice Taylor, the administrator for CSOD for putting everything together. And you know, the problem that we have is that all of our conversations are just so preliminary. You know, we are only able to uh, just touch upon, barely touch upon all of these different aspects. And we, there's just no time to, to really delve into any particular topic, but uh, we can, we can arrange that too. So I want to thank everybody for your time. And I want to wish everyone uh, a wonderful evening. This, uh, this session is being recorded. And in a couple of days, it will it will uh, it will be available to you. Okay.